and everything I've looked at, Calvary Chapel is orthodox. Uh, they believe in the grace of God, they believe in faith, they believe in salvation. As Paul said in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, they've come in the right way. I would say that um, Calvary Chapel's theology is pretty well right down the line of um, old-fashioned evangelical and uh, evangelistic uh, doctrine. Um, there's no doubt of their belief in God's plan of salvation. They believe in the cross of Jesus Christ, in the power of the blood to cleanse from sin. They believe in the uh, uh, veracity of the Word of God. They believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the second coming of Christ. I like the emphasis that is constantly being placed on the fulfillment of prophecy and uh, the coming of the Lord. I, uh, I have really very little to complain about the, the doctrine. From a theological standpoint, it sort of has an identity all its own. Uh, it, it's sort of a, a hybrid, I guess. Uh, I heard somewhere that Baptists think Chuck is a Pentecostal and Pentecostals think he's a Baptist. And so there's a certain amount of ambivalence uh, among people about exactly where it lands doctrinally. So it has sort of an identity all its own, but that's not to be... Um, we're not to be surprised by that because there is a progression in history in the development of doctrine so that at every point in time in the history of the church uh, there, is, there are movements that have nuances of newness to them and freshness to them. Calvary Chapel, although it's very open to the gifts of the Spirit and Chuck Smith himself indicates that he speaks in tongues in private, nevertheless in terms of public worship it's quite seldom that one sees anyone speaking in tongues or any direct ex uh, charismatic, more Pentecostal experience. So one might characterize Calvary Chapel as having a kind of soft Pentecostalism as opposed to a hard Pentecostalism. They are definitely in the charismatic stream, but I would see them in what I call an, a healthy charismatic approach in that rather than emphasizing the Holy Spirit to where they neglect the other two persons of the Trinity, they tend to cause the body to look at the Spirit in a very healthy way. And I think that the Calvary Chapel's theology of the Holy Spirit has allowed non-charismatic churches have a good look at the charismatic movement without being scared. Calvary Chapel has not been a charismatic church from the traditional charismatic kind of a uh, back, what you th think of when you think of charismatic. We do believe in the validity of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the church today. However, we believe that if the gifts of the Spirit are to be in operation within the church, then we should follow the biblical rules that have been set down. I have held healing services in the Calvary Chapels, but done in what I call decently in an order. So I would say it's very very orthodox, very orthopractic. The orthopraxy is, is right there. I would say the charismatic is very, uh, should I say, done in good taste. Done in good taste. It's neither to the, it's not to the extreme. Calvary Chapel traditionally has made the emphasis upon the teaching of the Word. Uh, in the uh, Gospel of Mark, it sort of concludes where they went everywhere uh, preaching the Word and the Holy Spirit working with them with signs following. And so these signs shall follow those that believe. And we, we believe that God can work in miraculous ways today and does work in miraculous ways today. However, the signs are not the major thing. They're sort of a secondary thing. They follow the teaching of the Word and the preaching of the Word. How do you work with churches like the Vineyard who more or less came out of Calvary Chapel, so to speak, and started doing things their own way? Is there competition? Is there a, a sense of spiritual uh, uh, budding heads? 
And these are the questions when it relates to philosophy of ministry that have to be addressed. The pastors were wanting to move more into the realm of experience. They were wanting to make the emphasis of their ministries the experiencing of these signs and of these wonders. And, and they were wanting to make that the dominant issue of the ministry rather than the teaching of the Word. In other words, that was to be their primary emphasis. And, and the Word would then be trying to find the Word that would sort of verify the experience rather than the experiences that just grew out of the Word. And so uh, a group of them uh, decided that um, that's the emphasis that they wanted to take. And so they went with our blessings. Uh, we encouraged them, in fact, to change their name to Vineyard and uh, to uh, go ahead and, and if that's the direction they felt they wanted to go, let's not break the fellowship. Uh, they did subsequently break the fellowship, but we encourage them to remain in fellowship. Surely our love for Christ and His Word should be greater than uh, the, the different emphasis that we have taken. To me, the highest mark of Christian maturity is the ability to agree to disagree and still love each other. And so many Christians fight over so many things that don't deal with heaven and hell. They frankly deal with our personal preferences and our doctrinal distinctives. And I, I think Chuck Smith has really mastered, through the grace of our Lord, uh, the ability to look at uh, controversial issues and disagreeing viewpoints and to handle them wisely and kindly. He's a great example in that. We got up at the following pastor's conference and told the pastors that this other group had formed and if they wanted to make that the major emphasis of their ministry that they should leave and and go and become a part of this other group uh, that uh, our intention was just to stick with the teaching of the Word of God with the signs following and and seeing and not making that the major emphasis of the ministry to make the teaching of the Word and the uh, building up of the saints in the Word. I went back to my hometown and I loved my city and, and I wanted to see God move in my city. And so as I went back there, I got involved in a little church and they received me, I received them, and it was a great uh, time together. I was there for about a year and I learned how not to have church because it was a Pentecostal church that was out of control. And I was really, I grew up a lot there that one year, learning how the gifts were not to be used. That we be not as babes who are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And you see, that's the background I came from, Mike. And I didn't want to go back into that background. The Lord brought me into the place of building up the body, teaching and making a strong body that aren't moved with every wind of doctrine. And uh, I think that uh, historically, uh, in the past uh, years, the past 10 years are history now, uh, but if you, you look at that standpoint, you see how that they have followed one uh, wind of doctrine after another, one experience after another, and the, there's the lack of stability because you're always looking for some new experience, some new phenomena that uh, you can't explain, or some new working, some and they're always talking about this new move of the Spirit, new wave of the Spirit, and they're just tossed to and fro, and, and, and they don't have a strong enough biblical background to many times discern uh, whether or not it is really biblical or not. In about 1973 or so, I was attending a Baptist church um, for the fellowship and all. I was going to Biola at that time. And um, the, I became very good friends with the, the um, young adult pastor. I, at that time, was a young adult. I was 23. And I still remember driving with him from the Baptist church, and we were going out for lunch because we went to Biola together. And as we drove out from the church there, the First Baptist Church there in Downey, and drove down a, a street that was right next to the church, there was a... A, um, it looked like a garage that, <laughs> excuse me, had, uh, it had, somebody had spray painted on the side of this small garage, something like New Life Ministry. And uh, as we drove by, my friend John says to me, that's a church there in that garage. I said, really? And he goes, yeah, we think it's a cult. And I'm telling you, it was 
red spray paint. Somebody had just gone out and just New Life Ministry in red spray paint. And um, later on, I found out it was Jeff Johnson. And that's where he had begun his uh, services. And it was right there. Jeff, uh, Marie, my wife, and I met Jeff and Karen um, not, not, not long after that. And uh, so I've known Jeff and Marie has been friends with Karen. We've known him for a long time. Um, as I've mentioned, Jeff, um, Jeff dedicated my daughter Corinne to the Lord when she was a month old. And uh, all the problems I've ever had, <laughs> I blame on Jeff and his incorrect dedication of my daughter. But so we've known him a long time, and, and he, over the years, became and has become a very dear friend of mine. So when I see him uh, sharing some things that, and talking about how he had, he had gone to a Pentecostal church that was really an out-of-order kind of congregation, and he has shared that more than once with us and all, and how that he, um, he learned some things of the Holy Spirit, um, what not to do, but with uh, Pastor Chuck and under Pastor Chuck's ministry, he learned what balance is. And that's what we're going to be looking at today out of Acts. I'm going to use uh, verse 8 as my introduction. And then I'm going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to share some things that uh, relate to uh, our, our um, experience and, and things that we relate to scripturally as it pertains to the Holy Spirit. This is a balanced th theology. And uh, so let me read verse 8. And give you an introduction, and, uh, and we'll see where we, we can go. Verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so let me begin to give you um, some insight into to my own personal spiritual journey as it pertains to the works of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I was raised in the Catholic Church, but I never really went beyond basic doctrine. I never became a theologian of any sort. You know, I, I was raised in the church. I was baptized an infant and in December of 1950. Uh, I went to catechism classes and when I was seven, eight years old. I ultimately and received my, my uh, first communion when I was uh, 12 or 13. I received my confirmation I still remember my confirmation name. My confirmation name was Richard. And the reason I called myself Richard wasn't because I named myself after a saint, because that's what you do when you receive your confirmation and you take a new name. Uh, I just had a buddy named Ricky that I really thought was cool, and I wanted to be like Ricky. So even I actually signed my Social Security card, David Richard Rosales, uh, when I went in the Army. I went in the army as David Richard Rosales because uh, I didn't know that your confirmation name was not a legal name. And I don't have a middle name, so I took the name uh, Richard uh, from there. Uh, when I got older and stopped doing that, I changed my middle name to, to Little Savage. But, um, <laughs> and I married Sad Girl. <laughs> anyway... So I never went beyond basic doctrine. Um, I, I had never heard the, the Catholic um, teaching related to the experience that Jesus is speaking about here in Acts 1.8 when he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Uh, that is the experience of what is called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I had never heard that term. We were not taught that term in our basic catechism classes and all. So I'd never heard of that. You see, the, the church teachings uh, didn't speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit at that time. I hadn't heard it. The church didn't use that term, uh, but they did teach, and this is um, Catholic theology, they did teach that the Spirit is given at baptism. So when the charismatic movement hit the Catholic church, um, they, they had an answer for what was being said because the term baptism of the Spirit was being used. But what they said at that time, and still do, is, well, no, that's the renewing of the baptism in the Spirit, which in Catholic theology is really a reference to water baptism. Well, around 1969, 
there was a, a movement that was sweeping the world. It was called the charismatic movement. Uh, many of you have probably heard of that, but I'm going to assume that, that um, most of you are younger and, and would not remember that. But it was called the charismatic movement. And uh, people were beginning to experience the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Catholic theologians began grappling with what was then happening. You see, again, from a Catholic point of view, the baptism of the Spirit has been dis defined as a religious experience which initiates a decisively new sense of the powerful presence and working of God in one's life, which working usually involves one or more charismatic gifts. And so that was starting to happen amongst people in the Catholic Church, even the Catholic Church itself. Even Baptists were beginning to ask God for more of the Spirit to fall on us afresh. And so that was a, a, a very unique moment in church history that was happening at that time, but I hadn't heard of it. So when I got saved, I went to Calvary Chapel, and that's where I was introduced to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I still remember I, I was at a home after Bible study, and there was a young man who was uh, seated in the front room, and his back was against the wall, and I was on a, a couch, and he was probably six feet away from me. He was right there. His back was against a wall, and he was moving kind of, in a, in a, you know, slowly, and he was speaking in a way, in a, I thought it was gibberish. It was just something I didn't understand. And so one of the older believers, he must have been at least four months old in the Lord, came and sat next to me, and I asked him, what is he doing? What's he doing? And he said, oh, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight, and he's speaking in tongues. And I said, oh, Really? And that was the first time I heard the phrase, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that's the first time I ever heard the phrase, speaking in tongues. And so somebody came and sat next to me. And this young man was still kind of quietly speaking to himself. And the young man turns to me and he says, what's he doing? And so I now became the theologian. And, and I turned to him. I still remember looking at him. And I said, oh, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit tonight. He goes, Really? Really? I said, yes. And he goes, and what's he doing? I said, he's speaking in tongues. Because that's what I had just been told. And I was just, he's speaking in tongues. He says, he is? I said, yeah. I, I think it's Hebrew, but I'm not sure. <laughs> See, so I went a little bit further than I should have. But I still remember that. I still remember being there and watching this take place, seeing what was happening. But I became curious about the power uh, of the Spirit, a power that is made available to us as believers. You see, Jesus had promised this, and, and I wanted it in my own life. He said, you shall receive power. And, and I, I know the weakness of my flesh. I know that the will is present, but the ability to perform that which I desire is not. I know in the energies of my own flesh and the strength that I have in my own will that will not give me the power to do those things that I most desperately desire. I need another source of power. I need something greater, you know, and, and I'm aware of that. I, I'm sure every believer in this room is too, how the will is present and the ability to perform that which you desire very often is not. How you want to do what is right and find yourself often doing that which is not. And so I know that about myself. I knew that from when I got saved, that I need something beyond me, something to help me do those things that I I very seriously want. And so uh, I became aware of this promise here in Acts 1, and, and, uh, and I wanted that in my own life. And, and so I, 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 in early 1971, I prayed with a group of young believers, and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I didn't see that as some odd thing. I, I, I think, unfortunately, what has taken place in, over the years since that uh, innocent time in the early 70s is that um, some of the more outlandish behaviors that are associated with Pentecostalism have found themselves uh, broadcast on television. And, and so people will be acting out in the flesh, blaming it on the spirit, and then the, the world will 
tune in on this particular program and they'll just kind of like watch these people. And some of you have seen some of the extremes. I've seen extremes. I've, I've been in meetings. One in particular comes to mind where they had what are called holy rollers. And some of you know what holy rollers are. Um, I had heard of it because when I grew up, my mom said, well, you know, my mom wasn't a Christian. But I still remember my mom trying to teach me some basic life theology. And she said, you have the Catholics and you have the hallelujahs. That's what my mom called Pentecostals. She said, you've got the hallelujahs. And people still to this day, some of you may have grown up hearing that term, because the hallelujahs were the Pentecostals. And it turns out my grandmother, my mom's mom, was a hallelujah. And so my mom said, oh, there's the Catholics and there's the hallelujahs. And the hallelujahs were known for being pretty extreme. They had TV program with Oral Roberts in the 50s and all. And my mom, I still remember Mama ironing and, and, and turning on the television to watch Oral Roberts as he did whatever Oral Roberts was doing at that time. And so I grew up aware of some things, but not uh, able to explain why people did that and all. And now I'm saved, and, and I want to have all that the Holy Spirit has to offer me. And that's why I asked him, and, and I said, I need your power. You see, I didn't see that as an odd request. I saw it as common sense. Uh, why wouldn't I want something that God freely promised to give me? Why wouldn't I want that? Why wouldn't I want all the power that I need to live for Christ? Why wouldn't I want that? Why wouldn't I want to exercise gifts of the Holy Spirit to see God move through my life? It just made sense. I didn't overanalyze it. I simply said, whatever it is, I want that. I want more of you. And, I, and I, I, wa I want to exercise gifts, and I want to, to see you move in my life and, and the life of the church, you know. And so it was freely offered. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus said it like this, verses 11 through 13. He said, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? See, so I was reading my Bible. I was taught to do that when I got saved. And I was reading it every day. I came across this passage in Luke. I've never forgotten it. Your Father in heaven will give you the Spirit if you ask. And I wanted the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I went to Calvary as a young believer... Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, I, I saw that, that the ministry was basically emphasizing two things. One, uh, Chuck Smith, the pastor, and those who would teach would emphasize the Word of God. Everything had to be viewed by the lens of Scripture. You just didn't say, oh, I feel this way, therefore it's true. Pastor Chuck, from the very beginning of my Christian life and the influencers in my life said, if you have a spiritual experience, there needs to be a scriptural explanation. You have to see it. You see it in, in Acts 2. You see it when the apostle Peter is there on the day of Pentecost, and, and the 120 are in that upper room awaiting the promise of the Father, and, and then, then the 120 are baptized by the Holy Spirit, and they, they empty out of that upper room, and they go into the streets, and they're speaking in languages they've never learned, and, and people begin to mock them, and they say, these people are filled with new wine. Remember that? And how the Apostle Peter stood up filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a guy who not, not very long before had denied knowing the Lord. And this is now a man who's got power and he's, he's, he's got that, that sense of the presence of God and the authority that God gives. And, and, and he says, uh, men of Israel, these men are not drunk with wine as you suppose. And he goes on to say, but this is that which was uh, given to us by Joel in, in which he would say that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. My sons and my daughters shall prophesy. And he starts to quote scripture because every spiritual experience, you might want to mark this in your heart, has got to have a scriptural explanation because the enemy has a tendency of trying to take us down the wrong path. I'll share a couple things about that in just a moment when we begin to use our experience as the measuring rod of truth. It has to be scriptural. And that's what Pastor Chuck taught us. He said to us, it's in the Word of God. The Word of God and the second pillar, if you will, is the Spirit of God. So my pastor had been a Pentecostal evangelist. Some of you may not know that. Chuck Smith 
was a Pentecostal evangelist. He and his brother Paul used to be the Singing Smith Brothers. And they would go to different four square churches and uh, they would sing together. And then, then my pastor would give a, a, an evangelistic message. And, and he, was, uh, he, he used to say of himself that he was a frustrated evangelist because he just wanted people to be saved so desperately and all. And so he had come out of a Pentecostal uh, background. He was a Pentecostal evangelist and a pastor in a Pentecostal church, four square church for many years. And he wanted to walk in the fullness of the spirit. But he wanted the walk of the Spirit to be informed by God's Word. So that's of incredible importance to all of us, especially to me. Because I began to see things happen that needed biblical explanations. The Jesus movement is, for some people, just something that occurred 50 years ago, and, and that's ancient history, but it's, it's my history. I, I was part of it. And so I remember some of the things. There was a, an amazing explosion of the presence of God by the power of the Spirit, that, that I was, as a brand new believer, I had never seen anything like it. I went to a revival one time because we would go to, to church the way I used to go to parties. You know, when you're, when you're in the world, they say, there's a party in Norwalk, there's a party in, in wherever, you know, and, and we would go to the party. And we'd all just jump, and I'll, well, when I got saved, my friends who I used to party with, many of them, they'd say, there's a, there's a revival taking, and off we'd go to get into the revival, and I still remember that. And I saw things sometimes in church services that I still to this day don't have an explanation for. I saw things, but I still don't have an explanation for what I saw. I'll give you one example. I don't want to confuse you and give you questions, but why not? Let's share this. Um, no, I was at this revival, and somebody had, the evangelist had invited us to, to receive the power, you know, those who at the baptism of the Spirit, and so we were at what they call a tarrying, tarrying bench, and and we were kneeling at the altar, and I was saying, God, fill me with your spirit. And some young man had gone outside into the parking lot, and uh, they, car they dragged him in. He had actually collapsed in the parking lot, and they, they dragged him in. And I still remember I was, like, kneeling right here, and they brought him around the front and brought him on and laid him down right in front of me. And there were several of us who were kneeling here, and now this, this young man is right in front of me, his right in front of me, his face, and my face is looking into his face. That's how close we are. And he's making odd sounds, you know, making sounds, you know, and, and it, it, but his eyes are closed. He's totally, he's, it's like he's out. And his hand, I don't know, some of you have maybe heard of this movie. It's an ancient movie called The Beast with Five Fingers. And it was about a hand that had been severed. It was a murderer's hand, and it had a life of its own. It was a corny movie, but it was in the 50s. I still remember. And it would, <laughs> picture yourself being chased by a hand and not being able to outrun it, okay? And it would crawl up the bed and grab you in the throat. And needs. Anyway, so this guy, <laughs> it's true. And this, this fellow was laying there, and I saw his hand as if it had a mind of his own. I still don't know. And it began to move, and it landed on his chest and began to crawl up like this while his eyes are closed. And I'm like, <laughs> looking. I am not kidding. And it grabs him by the throat and squeezes. I am not kidding. Why would I kid? I'm teaching. His face gets red. He's choking right in front of me. I'm going, whoa. And he's, <laughs> by his own hand. And I, I had just read about casting demons out. So I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you. I'm saying this. I'm, a, I'm less than a month old in Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you. Come out of him and leave him alone. And I took his hand. Now his hand was squeezing his throat enough to make his face red. He was being choked, and it felt like a feather. I'll never forget that. I just took his hand, and his, the blood, his face becomes normal. There were things like that I began to see as a new Christian. And I thought, something's going on here that I am not aware of. I have never been around anything like this. And so there was a time when the Holy Spirit, because we were innocent, we just would pray 
as young believers, we're, we're the oldest amongst us was about a year old in Christ. The rest of us were months old. We were babies. You see, we would go to Bible study at Costa Mesa. Then we'd come to a house and we would sit in a circle, hold hands and uh, and one first we would sit around and talk about the study. What did you hear? What did you get out of it? How do we put we would do that because we were hungry. We wanted to know how to serve God. And amongst my friends, that is what we talked about. We didn't leave a Bible study like many today and just go and talk about everything else. We didn't do that. We would leave a Bible study and talk about what we learned. How are we going to put that into practice? How does that affect us? Did you hear it when he said this? And that's, that was my early upbringing. Stay in the word. Understand God. Live for you. That was what we all, all my friends were that way. And so we'd sit and we'd talk about the Bible study. And then we would sing. And we'd sing some songs that we'd heard. Many of the songs you hear now are later than when I first got saved. But some of the early ones we've been doing were the songs I learned. They're the ones I don't have to look at the words anymore. I just close my eyes and sing because they're in my heart. I've had them there for 40 some years. And so we would sing, we would, we would talk about the study, and then we'd hold hands and we would pray. That's what we did. And we would pray that God would fall on us, that God would move. And I still remember when I said, Father, in Jesus' name, I want all the power that you can give me. I want to live for you. I was hungry for that, like a lot of people to this day are. I wanted to know God, and I wanted to, to have that, that, that sense of his presence. And so Jesus is promising something to the church, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As, as mentioned in the study, Calvary Chapel, we're not Pentecostals, but we do understand the charismatic gifts. And we believe that the gifts are in existence, and we do encourage their exercise. We believe and we teach the baptism of the Spirit is vital. It brings with it a renewed desire for prayer, including freshness in your praise and adoration and, and thanksgiving. The baptism of the Holy Spirit creates a new or a renewed desire to read the Scriptures. There are those who say the Scriptures come alive. And there's a deeper desire to, to tell others about, about God, to witness. Uh, it's also frequently accompanied by a desire for fellowship with other Christians and by the manifestation of the gifts. You see, this is what happens when you're filled with, baptized with the Holy Spirit. You're hungry for the Word. You want to pray. You want to have fellowship. You tell other people. You know, I, I, I can stand up here as a pastor and I... And I can say, you know, this is what we do. It's the day I got saved. I can do that. The day I got saved, they said, read the word. They said, pray. They said, fellowship with other believers. And they said, and tell somebody. So that was my birth experience. That's, that's what we Jesus freaks were brought into. That to share about God, to, to read the word of God, to want to be around people who loved God. That's what we wanted. We already drank enough of the gutter water of the world. We wanted the fresh, pure water of the Spirit. We were tired of the garbage. We were tired of the lies that were told to us. We were, we were tired of, of the judgmental spirit of, of those who were Christians before us who said, if you're really a believer, cut your hair, put on some shoes. We had that. We had to put up with that. You know, they, they thought that we were just a, uh, a passing thing, you know, just a fad. But that wasn't true. What happened is God had reached down into our lives. God had changed us from the inside. So much so that many of us, you know, the, the guys you see like Jeff and, and Rawl and, and others like them, it became our life. It wasn't something we were just kind of doing right now. Hopefully I'll meet a cute girl at church and all of that. It was a transformed life. And I knew that I needed power to live in a world that was 100% in opposition. I knew it. I can't do this on my own. I need help every day. I might have a mind that wants to do it, and I might even read in order that I might learn how to do it, but if I don't have the energy to do it, it doesn't work. There are people that remind me of some of the cars you see when you go to the auto show. Perhaps some of you have gone to the auto show and all I've been going to the auto show that they have in Los Angeles since I was a little boy. And my sons and my grandsons have gone with us. And 
they'll have what they call concept cars. And you'll be walking and they'll say, there's a concept car. And you'll see this amazingly beautiful designed car. I, I, you know, I still remember looking at this one car, sports car, two-seater. And I'm just looking at this car and I'm saying, that is a beautiful car. I happen to like cars. And I'm looking at it going, oh, that's a nice car. But as beautiful as it was, it turns out it was a concept and it has no engine. If you lift up the hood, you look into an empty engine bay. There's no engine. And so I know I can be like a concept car. I can have all the outer appearance as if I'm doing well, but I've got no power for me to actually go anywhere. And so I don't want to just be a washed up hippie. I want to be a spirit filled hippie. I want to be a man who's transformed. That's where the Holy Spirit does his work. Sometimes we're all frustrated, aren't we? And, and Lord, you know, I want, you know, what I've learned to do, and I do this pretty much every day, pretty much every day, if not every day. Okay, I'll say it every day because I wake up with the same basic prayer every day. God, fill me with your spirit. Work in my life. Empower me because the enemy's after He's after me and he's after you every day. And he never takes a vacation. Have you noticed that? He never takes a vacation. And you can go off on your vacation. He's not on one. He's on assignment. And he's got little imps. And you know, oh, boy, this is great. And it's true. He's got imps that do his bidding. It's part of the structure of Ephesians chapter 6, principalities and powers. There is a structure, a hierarchy of a military order with the enemy being called the God of this age, the ruler of this world, who is the commander over an entire echelon of angelic fallen angels who are assigned in many ways to disrupt the kingdom of God and work against you being victorious. Not everything you go through is because some imp made you do it. Your flesh conspires with the enemy very often. But he's after you. And if you don't know that, you may be backsliding because he's after you. He is after you. And I know that. And I know that. And so I wake up every morning and I say basically the same thing. Father, help me today. Strengthen me today. I want to be faithful today. Fill me. Because I need his power. I need his power. People ask me, how, how is it that you've walked with the Lord for all these years? And by the power of the Holy Spirit and the love of his word. The basic two things I learned as a brand new Christian. The desire to know God's word the desire to, to communicate in prayer, the choosing friends who can lift my hands up and be with me and strengthen, help to strengthen me, and I can strengthen them, and being open about my faith. Those are the four basic things that have kept me strong for 48-plus years now. It's just a simple thing. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I need his strength, and Jesus promised it, that he would give it to us, and I have needed it. Again, when I first came to Calvary Chapel, there were people who were trying to classify the movement. Like it was said, some said we were Baptists because we emphasize God's word. Others said they're Pentecostals because we believe in the second experience of the baptism of the spirit. And they used to call us Bapticostals. I don't know if you ever heard that. Now, we did not and do not emphasize one gift over another. You see, early on, people began to tell me that these sign of the baptism of the Spirit was speaking in tongues. And I didn't see that in Scripture. I actually see something different. Because in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, Paul said, One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So I can have a desire for whatever gift, but it's the Spirit who gifts you. So you can desire to speak in tongues. There's not anything wrong with that. I do speak in tongues. My wife speaks in tongues. We have been baptized in the Holy Spirit with an expression of that particular gift, but that's not necessary for you to have the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not the only gift that he gives. You see, the gifts of the Spirit are intended to operate, in, and they operate. Here's something for you that you might find interesting. They operate in the church all the time, and sometimes people just aren't aware of that. We need to remember that Jesus is fully human and was not neurotic. And so it, when he would minister, it was so normal that people would be amazed at the works that were performed, but it wasn't as if he would 
clear his throat and then get kind of odd and then do something supernatural. That's not what he did. It's very natural. And when the Holy Spirit flows, there's a very, very great naturalness to it. Some people are afraid. Oh, I don't know if the Holy Spirit comes upon me. He may make me do something weird. And he doesn't. He actually makes you normal. I was, <laughs> that's nice. I, I, I was in a church service. It was a Sunday night. And um, I had given an invitation that night. And people had come forward, given their hearts to the Lord. And, and I was in the back of the church at the end of the service. This is when we were in Ontario High School. And I was standing in the back there in the auditorium when a woman approached me and said to me, this is my first time here, and I would like to ask you a question, if I may. And I said, of course. And she said, when does the Holy Spirit move here? And I said, excuse me? She said, when does the Holy Spirit move here? And he said, were you here in the church service today, or did you just walk in? She said, no, I was here for the service. I said, oh, okay. You're asking me when the Holy Spirit moves here? She said, yes. And it was a polite conversation. And I said, oh, well, were you here for worship? Did you worship with us? She says, yes, I did. I was here on time, and I worshiped with you. I said, the Holy Spirit moved. I said, were you here when I taught the word? She said, yes, I sat through the Bible study. I said, the Holy Spirit moved. I said, were you here when I gave an invitation and people came forward? She said, yes, I saw that. The Holy Spirit moved. I said, do you see those people standing over there? And there were pockets of people praying with one another. I said, do you see those people there? She says, yes, they're praying with one another. She says, yes. I said, the Holy Spirit is moving. I said, if you're asking me, when does the Holy Spirit move here? The Holy Spirit is moving right now. But you're really asking me when we speak in tongues, right? She says, yes. When do we speak in tongues? Because in some people's minds, that's the only gift of the Holy Spirit. But that's not what the Bible teaches. And even as you heard tonight, Pastor Chuck uh, spoke in tongues. I speak in tongues. My wife speaks in tongues. But we do it in the privacy of our prayer closets. We spend time with the Lord. He edifies and builds us up as we do that. You see, the gifts of the Holy Spirit operate, but not in the sensational way very often that people want to see. He is more subtle and more gentle and very often is do doing it in such a way that you might not even notice how God's moving. Now, Calvary chapels have resisted the effort to move in a different path. Um, how many of you have ever even heard of the vineyard movement? Raise your hand. See, a lot of you haven't. Well, I'll, I'll share a couple things with you about that movement because that's what was spoken of back in 92. There was a movement that was the vineyard churches. Some of you have heard of vineyards. How many of you have heard of vineyard churches? Same people. A lot of you um, are living under a rock. No, um, <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. You just haven't heard of it. Um, I'll say it really briefly to you because it was something that was a challenge in Calvary chapels. Um, and that's what Chuck was speaking about. The Vineyard Movement originally uh, was pastored by a man named John Wimber. John Wimber came out of the Friends Church. He used to pastor a church in Yorba Linda called the Friends Church. And uh, he had an experience with the Holy Spirit, and he eventually became um, aware of the Calvary Ministries to the point where he had associated with us. And so the Vineyard Churches, Vineyard Church was actually, or there were a couple of them, were actually Calvary Chapel ministries that were called vineyards. And so, at a certain point in the history of the vineyard movement and its Calvary affiliation and association, John Wimber began to, pa uh, began to uh, write books and was teaching a class uh, on signs and wonders at Fuller Seminary. And John Wimber uh, started using uh, writing books, like one was called Power Evangelism and all, and he wanted to do the stuff. For him, that was a phrase in the vineyard, doing the stuff. And he wanted to do the stuff, meaning he wanted to ha see miracles and, and the exercise of the gifts in a variety of ways and all. And he became uh, really caught up in the desire for that. And, and uh, eventually what happened is he began to move in a more extreme fashion. And I was at the conference that Chuck mentioned today, if you were listening to him as he was speaking, and he said, I invited people to move on. I was at that conference when that took place, and um, when Chuck did. 
And Chuck, you know, we all know, those of us who know the ministry of Chuck Smith know that he is a man who is filled with the love of God. He was a very loving man to us and all. And, but he also was very direct. And he would come to the pastor's conferences on occasion, and he would say this. I still remember it. He would say, um, if you don't want to be a Calvary Chapel, he's, that's great. You know, there are, there are needs for all kinds of ministries. And if you want to and you want to go in another movement and do that, please feel free to go. He'd say, and then he'd say, please, you know, don't go away mad. Just go away. Chuck would say that. And he's, he's pretty, he was pretty direct. And he wrote, he wrote a letter when I was an assisting pastor in Calvary Chapel of Claremont. And uh, he wrote us a letter and said, if you want to change your name, please do. Just have the courtesy to allow us to know that so we can remove you from our list of churches associated with Calvary. Chuck was that way. He wanted to keep the movement pure. And there were influences that were coming in that, that were trying to move us off track, Vineyard being one of them. And the church I was an assistant in, actually, uh, the senior pastor name was Marco. Marco retired out of ministry and handed the church over to a young man named Mark. Mark began to move in the direction of the Vineyard. So I was in a Calvary Chapel when the transitioning was taking place in that church. So I'm a firsthand witness as an assistant to what took place. And what was happening at that time was an emphasis on gifts began to override the concern to teach. And so we would have, instead of 40, 45 minutes of Bible study, we would have 15 minutes of Bible study. And instead of 15 minutes of worship, we had 45 minutes of worship. Then we had testimony time. And then we had operation of the gifts time. And it changed. That's one of the facets that went on to my choosing to resign from that ministry and to move into what I do here. It was going in a direction that ultimately he turned from Calvary Claremont to Vineyard Claremont. And the Vineyard Claremont, there is a Vineyard Claremont. Some of you may have heard of it. That was originally Calvary Chapel of Claremont, and it turned to Vineyard Claremont. And there's a second Calvary in Claremont that was started once again by the original pastor of the Calvary Chapel of Claremont, Marco, who has since retired from ministry again and left it in the hands of an assistant. But I was there. And I remember when, when Chuck invited people to change their name. And I remember the letter that we got. And I remember when Tom Stipes uh, gave a message who became Vineyard Denver. And he said, I've learned to do things decently in order, but I haven't learned to let all things be done. And when Chuck got up after he had spoken and said, if you want to be a Pentecostal, I'm not a Pentecostal. But if you want to be a Pentecostal, change your name because we are not Pentecostals. So that's, that's us. We have a belief in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The baptism is a second experience. We believe the gifts are in operation today, but we believe in the balance of Scripture and the Spirit. And that's, I hope, what you see here. You see, in the 80s, John Wimber, who was into doing the stuff and all, the Vineyard Movement produced many worship songs and some of those songs, if not many, were beautiful, but they were experience-oriented. It was songs no longer like what we were even singing tonight. They were songs of how I feel about God. And I remember that he started his own movement, and Chuck said goodbye. And Chuck, and Chuck had said to us, if you want to go, please do, but you need to change your name. Again, what we want is balance. We want the Word, and we want the Spirit. We emphasize doctrine, and we encourage putting that doctrine into practice by walking in God's power. And so finally, wrapping this up, I want you to see something here in verse 8, and I'll close with verse 8 and touch it a little bit now. That promise, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, to the end of the earth. I want you to... Hear this as I close. I'm going to give you a real brief touch on baptism of the Spirit. There are three prepositions that are used for the work of the Holy Spirit. The word with, the word in, and the word upon. In John 14, verse 17, Jesus used two of those words. He said, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, 
you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Those are two, um, those are, those are two prepositions speaking of the with and the in experience. Now, the Holy Spirit is with you in fellowship with him. The Holy Spirit is in you upon conversion. We become the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God dwells in us. But there's that third when he says the Holy Spirit is upon you. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The word upon in the Greek is the word epi, E-P-I, epi. And it speaks of the upon experience. It speaks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit from on high. Epi represents the work of the Spirit empowering the believer for service. It is the power of the Holy Spirit as he comes upon you and you're gifted by him and empowered by him. That is what you desired. It's what I desire. He had promised in Acts 1.8 that the Holy Spirit would come upon you. And in chapter 2, verse 3, you see the result of the promise, the day of Pentecost, when it says in verse 3, there appeared to them the 120 divided tongues as on fire, and one sat upon each of them. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can have the Holy Spirit in salvation you become the temple of the Spirit of God, the house of God, according to 1 Corinthians 3.16. But I want the upon experience. I am, I'm, I'm his, he's in me, but I want his power upon me. And that's the baptism. And the gift of the Holy Spirit was not just for these who were there that day on the day of Pentecost, because according to verses 38 and 39 of chapter Two, it says, Peter said, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you, to your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. This upon experience was not limited to the first generation. This upon experience is for all who call upon the name of the Lord through every generation. And so in the 21st century, you can say, God, and if you haven't, I need your power. I have to close, but I have one last thing. I've been wondering what's wrong with the church, because not this church, the church, us, throughout the world, okay? And uh, I've been wondering what's wrong with you guys. No, um, <laughs> something gets hurt feeling. No, I'm talking about us, the body of Christ. We're, what is wrong, especially in the United States? Because, you know, I could preach a sermon on this. I won't. I'm just saying a couple things. What is wrong with the church in the United States? Why? I, I think about this. Why? Why? I saw a picture uh, right around Super Bowl, Super Bowl of a stadium filled with fans. Some of you perhaps saw this, and they were wearing tarps, and there was snow on them in a stadium, snow on them. And, and the stadium was full. The stadium was full. And they're seated there, thousands of people, 50, 60, 70,000 fans, and I'm, I see the picture, and they're just, and they're huddled up, and you see this whole stadium in the snow watching a football game, and then what they did is they put another picture of a church service next to it that was empty, almost empty, and they didn't have to say a word. We are more, as a people, committed to our sports than we are to our God. So you ask, what is wrong? It's us. We've gotten bored with God, or perhaps we may not really know him, or we just want to do the minimum that allows us to get into heaven, and we have lost the desire to win the lost, because I shared with mom, she doesn't want to hear, so I'll just... I wasn't that way with my parents. You know, 
I'll be sharing this Sunday. I believe it's this Sunday. He who goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalmist says, he who goes forth weeping. And I think of it like this, guys. The church isn't weeping over the loss. This issue that we're dealing with right now with all these senators who said, no, do not save the life of a baby who is being aborted, came out alive, let it die on the table. Do you not see that as demonic? My, my granddaughter is two and a half weeks old or so. She'll be three weeks tomorrow. She was a month early. Listen carefully. She was a month early. A month early. She's alive out of the womb. And she's not even full term yet. And if I walked up to that baby and I pinched her arm, what do you think she'd do? She'd scream in pain, wouldn't she? She would scream in pain if I pinched her, took a needle, took a razor blade and sliced her. She would scream in pain. But we're saying that that baby could be nine months and someone can stick a needle in the base of her skull and poison her. And the pain she would feel is no different than if she was out of the womb. And we say that we can slice her in the womb and put her back together again just to make sure we got all the parts. This nation is going to be judged by God. I am not kidding you. Where we have gone. And all of these senators who said, don't save the life of that child. Yes, we need a revival. We need, a, and we, the church needs the power of the Spirit of God. We need a refreshing in the Lord, guys. We do. What made the Jesus movement real is the power of the Holy Spirit. It is what made me the man I am today. That spirit who came into me empowered me, gave me strength to stand and speak when others wouldn't, comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. So yes, if you have not received the power of the Spirit, you need to ask. Your Father will give the Spirit, he says, to those who ask him. Ask in faith, doubting nothing. Say, God, fill me. Forgive me for my sins, my weakness, and my inability to have a spine. I need you desperately in this last hour for such a time as this. We need the Holy Spirit.